What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Today is a true honor to be joined by Dr. Roy Taylor. Dr. Taylor, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Pleasure to be talking to you, Mike. Absolutely. For our listeners who might not be familiar with you and your work, could you provide us with a brief background about yourself and your current research focus? Sure. I'm Professor of Medicine and Metabolism at the University of Newcastle and consultant physician in the Newcastle hospitals. And I've spent most of my life uh, working in diabetes, clinically looking after real people, but also pushing forward on the research. And in particular, I've developed the techniques of using magnetic resonance, just like an MRI scanner, but to actually look inside the body. Now, this is a really exciting thing because you can chase where the food goes. So. Over the last 20 years, I've been examining what happens when we eat, which is what folk do several times a day. And then suddenly in 2006, all the pieces of the jigsaw seemed to fit together. And I could actually guess at what was causing type 2 diabetes. And I've spent the whole time since then focused on trying to find out if that's really true. And this all starts from an idea, which in scientific posh terms is a hypothesis. But what scientists really have to do is to set out to destroy their hypothesis. And I can tell you, 2006 till now, that's 14 long years, and I've completely failed to destroy my hypothesis. <laughs> and, that, and that's a beautiful thing. I don't think many scientists have the fortunate ability to say that same thing. Dr. Taylor, you've done some tremendous work in this field uh, in regard to diabetes when it comes to managing it, this idea of remission, which is now just an, an obtainable goal, right, for disease that for such a long time, we ultimately believe that, well, it's going to deteriorate over time. The best you can do is slow the deterioration, but you're, you're certainly not going to be able to reverse your condition or, or return to a healthy state. And it is, it's just an absolute pleasure to have you, the work you're doing in this field and being able to provide hope to these patients in this rapidly evolving field about how it's not that simple. There, there is a reason to believe that we can undo some of the harm that has occurred. And this is going to pave the way for our discussion today, talking about your specific research. But before we dive into that rabbit hole, I think it's important that we kind of set the groundwork in terms of definitions and in the context of remission, what exactly that means. Because as I've scathed through the literature, seen a couple of different papers and reviews on the topic, it doesn't seem to be an, an accepted universal definition at the moment. We just had Dr. Nicola Guest on the podcast podcast to talk about a, a recent meta-analysis from the BMJ. And when they defined remission, they more or less paid no attention to the use of medication. So remission could be achieved while still on all diabetic medications, which, which seems a bit silly. And, and I think you might say the same thing. So to set the stage, what exactly is remission? How would you define that? Well, I think we can be quite clear here, Mike. First of all, this question about drugs or not, now, remission is a state of being free from diabetes, and it makes a complete nonsense of that idea to suggest that the condition's still there, you need to suppress it with drugs, and you're in remission, honestly. No, it doesn't work like that. Now, in the UK, we have some consensus uh, guidelines on what remission is. This is a consensus between uh, the Society of Specialist uh, Doctors in Diabetes and the Society of Primary Care Doctors interested in diabetes. So it's quite a broad alliance. And we came out with three criteria. One was the HbA1c, this average measure of control, has got to be below the level at which diabetes will be diagnosed. That's pretty straightforward. But that's got to be achieved off all oral agents, all tablets or injections for treating diabetes. And it has to last for at least three months. Now, work is underway on an international set of guidelines led by the American Diabetes Association, and hopefully they will be published within a few months. And I can't comment on those because I was part of that process and uh, we'll see what comes out. But I can, I can say it's very solid ground to say this is HbA1c less than 6.5%. 
or 48 millimole per mole, and freedom from drugs to lower blood glucose. So if we just take that as a definition and say, yes, but it's got to be there for a little while before you can say, okay, this is remission. That was contentious, but three months is coming out as a figure that most people can sign up to. So we can be very clear about when someone can be said to be free of diabetes. Excellent. And now I think we can get into the, the origins here, the etiology of type 2 diabetes, which is the uh, twin cycle hypothesis, or perhaps as you originally recognized when you began your work, the twin cycle fairy tale, which I think was a beautiful way to state it. But I think objectively now we can refer to it as a hypothesis, if not, you know, the the real deal, right? So lay that out for our listeners and then perhaps following up with an explanation of the twin cycle hypothesis, we can talk about the original counterpoint study and the results sure. you found there. Sure. In 2006, the brilliant work of other people elsewhere in the world, Kit Peterson at Yale, New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, especially Hannah Leggy, Yikiyarvinen in Helsinki, Finland, and our own work in Newcastle all came together. And this showed very clearly that the amount of fat in the liver determined how sensitive the liver was to insulin. Now, one of the big problems and the puzzles of type 2 diabetes for a long time has been the fact that insulin doesn't work so well. But all of a sudden, with regard to the, the liver itself, not talking about the rest of the body for the moment, but with the liver, there was a very simple equation. If you've got excess fat in your liver, then you were more insulin resistant than if you had no excess fat in your liver. Now, that was running around in my mind. And I observed a particular person who came to me saying, look, I don't want to have this diabetes, what can I do to get rid of it? And at that time I had to say, well, I'm not certain, but it's very clear that if you were to lose about uh, 10 to 15% of your body weight, you'll get, you'll get better sugars first thing in the morning. Now, that's all I could say because the liver absolutely determines what your sugar was, Mike, when you woke up this morning. Hopefully your liver insulin sensitivity is fine. Your sugar would be fine because the liver is responsible for pouring out glucose all the time. People forget this. They imagine that sugar comes mainly from the food you eat. Well, indirectly, yes, but the body is enormously clever at regulating it. And it does it by the liver having an absolute monopoly on producing glucose, Without diabetes, you probably made about 10 grams of glucose or sugar overnight every hour for yourself. Just imagine that. If you slept for eight hours, you've made 80 grams of glucose that wasn't there and pumped it out into your body. If you had type 2 diabetes, Mike, you would have put out 50% more. You would have put out 120 grams of glucose. That's the extent of the difference we were talking about and I was suddenly looking at in terms of explaining diabetes. So I sent my patient on their way. I told them there's no guarantees of this, but it seemed a sensible thing to do in view of our latest findings. Blew me, this person came back in a few months. The sugar in the morning was normal, but the sugar after meals was normal. Boy, that set the brain spinning. And I wondered if the same process might be going on in the pancreas. Now, it just so happened that uh, over 20 years ago, uh, a brilliant American researcher called Roger Unger, who's one of the greats of diabetes research in the States, had demonstrated that fat in the pancreas can stop the pancreas producing insulin so well after meals. Now, suddenly we're talking about dealing with your breakfast. We're not talking about the overnight state. And I thought, could it be that this person has actually reduced their fat in the pancreas and the pancreas has woken up? And I sat down with a paper and pencil and it took me quite a while, but eventually I had it all figured out. Fat in the liver would be self-perpetuating, would create a vicious cycle, and eventually it would spill over because one of the jobs of the liver 
quite apart from making glucose to keep you alive overnight, is to supply fat to the rest of the body. We all need fat for energy. Most tissues burn it routinely. And also excess fat gets shunted into the fat under the skin, which is where we can store fat. Now, under the skin, you might think it's unsightly, but it's safe. It gets locked up there and it doesn't cause any metabolic damage. But if there's too much fat in the liver, it might be producing too much fat. And that might hang around in the blood and then start silting up, not only in the tissues under the skin, but also inside, say, your main blood vessels, inside the arteries of your heart, maybe this underlay heart attacks, and in your pancreas. And if Roger Runga was right, and I was right in applying it to humans, then diabetes suddenly is simple. Vicious cycle in the liver spilling over to vicious cycle in the pancreas. They interact because if you don't make enough insulin for your meals, the sugar goes high and it stays high for too long. And the poor old body eventually gets up a big insulin response slowly. And that actually makes things worse. And it drives this cycle onwards. So that may sound awfully complicated, but if I was to just put it in a simple sentence, it's that a person has accumulated more fat in their body than they can tolerate. So put that way, it's dead simple. Excellent. And I think this brings us to the design for the, the counterpoint study, which elucidated this and really cemented it to be true. So could you outline that for the listeners for us, Dr. Taylor? Yes, this, this is probably my most exciting moment in a lifetime of science and looking after, looking after people. The twin cycle hypothesis, if it was true, carried a prediction because everything was driven ultimately by eating a bit too much food at the top end. That's what started off the fat building up in the liver. And I reasoned that if we got rid of that influence, turned it into uh, a negative calorie balance, the body's got to use up its own resources, then these vicious cycles should spin in the other direction and the sugar level should go back to normal. Ha! Now, you can understand why I referred to it as a fairy tale, because there I was sitting in an armchair dreaming about things. But of course, we can test that. I could find out exactly how wrong I was by getting ordinary folk with type 2 diabetes to lose a substantial amount of weight and then we'd see what happened by our special tests. Now, to get people to lose a substantial amount of weight, uh, I knew that this was difficult. The ordinary ways that are talked about to lose weight, slow, steady, cutting back on the amount you eat, etc., just aren't tolerable. But I did know of old work which showed you can lose weight very successfully, very rapidly, using a low calorie diet. And we could now make that much easier by using commercially produced products that satisfy appetite, just give you about 700 calories a day, and it would allow people to lose weight as easily as possible. So, that was what we started off doing. And then after the second or third person went through this test, which was an eight week test to lose an aim of 33 pounds body weight in eight weeks, my doctor who is supervising the day-to-day -day work came to me and said, look at this, the fasting sugar was returning to normal in everybody. And it looked as though the cycle was right. But once we gathered the whole information, finished the study, we were able to publish the counterpoint study, 2011 now, and we showed type two diabetes, too much fat in the liver, the liver is insulin resistant, it produces too much sugar. When you remove the fat, all those things disappear. Sugar production goes back to normal. Inside the pancreas, there was more fat than in a group of people who didn't have diabetes, but were matched for everything like weight and age, etc. And when the pancreas fat went down, and of course we measured that using our MRI techniques, 
when the pancreas fat went down, amazingly, the insulin producing cells woke up and we could see that it was very gradual. After one week, there was hardly any difference. Four weeks, it was getting on the eight weeks. They were awake. It was the most astonishing thing. As I say, the most exciting moment in my medical career, a real eureka moment. So I knew that all the information that people were given when they were diagnosed, this is a lifelong condition, you require increasing number of tablets, 50% chance of being on insulin injections in 10 years time. That was all wrong. And so this was absolutely dramatic. And when I announced the results, people were very excited, but there was a huge amount of skepticism because doctors know from their experience that people get worse and worse over the years and everything they said seemed to be true. But of course, nobody had removed this amount of weight and then kept it off. So that led to our second study, which was the keeping it off bit. But I ought to stop talking there because I've described this counterpoint study, which was enormously exciting. And it just showed that the predictions of this hypothesis were absolutely what happened to real people. Brilliant. And I think this is a nice pit stop before we get into the longer term research that you've conducted. And that is talking about the personal fat threshold. So we've established that uh, excess fat overall, if you have more fat in your body, there's a higher probability that it's going to be in the wrong places as well. So in the liver, in the pancreas, where we see that's driving this dysfunction of two, type two diabetes. But I think this also brings up the point and many might be wondering is why people who don't have a lot of fat in general, relatively speaking, they may have a normal BMI, but also have type two diabetes, whereas someone who has more overall weight and body fat might not have that condition. So how do we, how do we explain those differences to those people? That's a really good question. Let me start off with a quite a shocking statistic. Many people describe type 2 diabetes as being a disease of obesity. That's commonly said. Even doctors say it. They shouldn't. If we look at people with a body mass index over 40, now these are the really large people in our population, what percentage of them do you think have type 2 diabetes? Very few. Only at 28%, and that's US data that I'm quoting there. So obesity, even severe obesity, doesn't cause diabetes. Certainly it's more common in that group, but that's a bit different. So that's the first statistic. The second point I'd make is that, at least in the UK, when people get diabetes, the average body mass index they're at at that moment is 30. Now, that's a cutoff between overweight and obesity. And I can say very clearly that if the average is 30 at this point, then half of the group has got a body mass index above 30. Yes, they're obese. The other half are non-obese. And in fact, one in 10 of them, that's 10%, are actually in the normal weight range, less than 25. And in fact, that's exactly where my very first patient was when I was just beginning to get these ideas together. So we've got a range of body mass indexes. Let me take you on a journey. Just imagine working, walking down your local high street. Look at the people. Are they all the same shape? <laughs> well, no. There are some people who look as though they're built to be in the front row of a rugby scrum or big American football players. There are other people who look as though they'd be really good at long distance running or cross country. And quite clearly, people have got a body build that varies. Now, if your natural body build leaves you with a BMI of 20, going up the, to the dizzy heights of 24 is quite a lot of weight if you are susceptible to the effects of fat. Now, that brings in another factor you've got to be susceptible at a certain level. And if we go back to these people with a very high BMI, the really big people in this world, they are clearly not susceptible to fat. And in fact, there was proof of this because 
Roger Unger, no less, that giant of diabetes, showed that if you examined rats that were genetically prone to get type 2 diabetes, if you overfed them, and compared them with the littermates who just happened to lack that particular gene, and you could overfeed them, they never got diabetes. Now, he took out the insulin producing cells, and he showed that if he exposed the, uh, the cells to fat, the cells from the animals that were going to get diabetes stopped producing insulin. If you expose the cells from the littermates who weren't going to get diabetes to fat, they were just fine. They didn't turn a hair. Show them an increase in glucose, whiz, up goes the insulin. So there it was right back in 1994, we had the evidence of variable susceptibility. Now in animals, we're talking about single gene effects that we can study and that's fine in the lab. But of course, people have got a whole mix of genes and we don't have a choice with the, the lottery of what genes you get uh, that you're born with, but you're certainly stuck with them. And it certainly seems the case that this lottery of genes will assign you a certain degree of susceptibility. So the people who get type two diabetes with a BMI of 24 are, have just been a bit unlucky, you might say, with this lottery. They're susceptible to the, the fat. And it's this concept of the individual, which is so important. And it gets away from this talk of BMI, because classifying people with BM, by BMI would lead to ridiculous things. For instance, uh, just imagine going up to this front row, uh, the forward in the rugby team and saying, your BMI is 34, you're obese. <laughs> no, no, he's just a big guy. Now, when he stops playing, yes, that muscle may well turn into fat. He may get uh, obese and he may get a BMI of 38. He may get type 2 diabetes. But if he loses his weight down to BMI of 34, his doctor says, but you're still obese. Well, no, he's lost his diabetes. And that's exactly what we see in our big studies, because the effect of losing 33 pounds in weight is the same whether your BMI is 45 or whether it's 27. And that's the extent of our BMI in uh, one of our big studies. So you're your own person, you're an individual. And so don't compare yourselves with others. If you've got type two diabetes, unfortunately you've become heavier than your body can cope with. That's a personal fat threshold. Hey guys. Mike here. If you're interested in learning more about how to maximize your health, body composition, and performance, head over to hammerawayfitness.com where you can sign up for coaching or even just schedule an hour consult with me to get some of your training and nutrition questions answered. Also, if you enjoyed this episode as much as I did and would like to further support the growth of the Muscle Memoirs podcast, you can give a donation to the link in the show notes leave us a review, and or share this episode with your friends, whether that be dropping the link in a group chat or putting a screenshot in your Instagram story. I truly appreciate it. Fantastic. And I'm not sure if this is one in the same or, um, but within the context of the personal fat threshold, some people more be more susceptible to the effects of fat. What also comes to mind are the genetics involved in fat distribution, right? So whether they store that fat towards the visceral or towards out under, under the skin, and then maybe furthermore, the differences between males and females, right? Since males tend to store that fat um, viscerally, are there differences in terms of rates of type 2 diabetes between males and females for that reason? Yes. And that's a very good place to start on this, on this point about genetics of fat distribution. Because yes, men tend to store any excess fat centrally. They get what in Britain we call a beer belly. Uh, you know, it's quite common for men to be portly and have a generous uh, bulge over their waist. And that's somehow regarded as normal with our curious view of society. But women, if they have excess food, tend to put it on under the skin. And uh, that's just 
a biological difference, which presumably is written into the the messages of the sex hormones, it just determines how things happen and where the fat is stored. But men get type 2 diabetes at a lower uh, BMI than do women. So women have got to get more obese, obviously, under the skin. And only then, on average, does it start spilling over. So yes, there is a difference. And it goes beyond there. Because if we look at people of different ethnicity, now we're all the same species. Metabolism is crashingly uh, simple, well-designed, and it's the same across humans. But if people from South Asia and the Far East put on excess weight, they have a disproportionate tendency to put it on centrally. So what we call central obesity inside the tummy and therefore inside the liver and inside the pancreas is far commoner in Asian people at any given uh, body mass index. And so we can see again, there's a complex of genes that's determining this. And if we look at people with type two diabetes with what we might say was a normal BMI, yes, there is an overrepresentation of people from South Asia because of this genetic effect. It's not your fault that you might have a big, a generously sized bottom. It's not your fault that you might have uh, a beer belly in the way of where the fat is distributed. But of course, it's potentially in your gift just to reduce a total amount in the body. And this relates to a question which I'm sure your listeners will be interested in, or at least uh, many of them would be. They come back and say, look, I've lost the fat doctor. I feel great. I feel 10 years younger. It's just wonderful. But I've lost it from all the wrong places. And especially women just find that they've lost some of their curves that they would like to have kept. And sadly, we have no easy answer to this. Even now, the year 2021, with fabulous advances in medical science, we do not understand what controls the fat deposition. You know, why is it spread evenly under the skin? Why don't we keep it all in a big hump like a camel? We don't know. And so you've touched on something that really is worthwhile exploring, but that's for future investigators to do. Yeah, I appreciate you making that point. Uh, a large segment of my population that I work with are people that are in pretty good shape and they want to be in great shape. So a common question is, well, in my pursuit to get in great shape, there's this stubborn area of fat that I want to get rid of. How do I do that? I'm like, well, the best answer is to lose more overall fat and it'll, it'll come down eventually to a degree. Yes, there's, there's an extra detail that might be useful to add in view of that, Mike. And that is that when people do start an exercise program, now we ought to come on to exercise separately, but exercise does have a modest but specific effect of tending to slightly reduce the fat in the center. So uh, that is, that's a factor that's quite important. And in relation to the question from men that I get, they come back having lost 33 pounds. Some of them say, look, I'm, I'm a bit worried because I think I look puny. Now, this especially comes from men in positions of power, politicians, big businessmen. And of course, you'll know the answer to this. They've got to work out in the gym. They need to build up their shoulders, neck, and also just their confidence. You don't have to be big to come across powerfully. So, you know, I can put over those points. Yes, if you want to regain, if you want to fill out your shirt collar again, do it with muscle. And so that's a specific answer. And for those men who want to do that, they will do that. And it's a potentially useful adjunct to everything we've said so far. Absolutely. I love that. Let's move on into some of your longer term research following up from that counterpoint study, looking at counterbalance and direct. And let's, uh, they, they were kind of similar in nature. There were slight differences in design, but perhaps just generalizing these interventions and, and what you found in these studies. Sure. 
the big question after Counterpoint in 2011 was, will this last or was it just a flash in the pan? Because all the studies were done during the low calorie diet. And some skeptics said, well, look, as soon as you go back onto normal food, the diabetes hasn't gone away. It can't do. It'll still be there. So in counterbalance, we dropped people's weight and then we kept it steady for six months. They just visited our research center on a monthly basis, and were advised, weighed and encouraged. And we found that people, once they got rid of their diabetes, with keeping their weight steady, and incidentally, all people in this study kept their weight absolutely steady for six months. Um, we found the diabetes just stayed away. The insulin cells continued to be completely as frisky as normal. And so great news from uh, counterbalance. We knew that this is durable, but we had to go further. Originally, I was pondering on what caused type two diabetes. That's a research question I've been chasing for my life, Mike. And we seem to have found that, but I was uh, pulled off course almost by the intense pressure of people with diabetes. Now, after that 2011 paper, my email inbox was just trashed by people wanting details and asking all the information, which is why it's all on our website, my new Newcastle University website, uh, available for free. But um, indirect, I had to answer a big question which needed to be answered. Would it be possible for doctors and nurses in family practice, they're in office practice in the States, primary care, uh, in, in the UK, would it be possible for them to use these methods to deal with all comers and get the diabetes into remission? So we set about a large randomized controlled trial. Now, this means that people have allocated a chance to either having the weight loss approach or having standard treatment. And over two years, we showed that starting off with 149 people in each group, so a big, big study, we had exactly one third, just over one third of people in the weight loss group who at two years were completely free of diabetes, off all drugs, they were in remission and they felt great. Now that was achieved in ordinary primary care practice and we as specialist investigators and specialist trainers, we didn't take part in that. We just trained the general practice nurses. It wasn't doctors, it was nurses and some dietitians. And they had eight hours of structured training. So we answer the question, yes, this is practical. This is a goer. Now, I'd say right away that the big problem remains that keeping the weight down in the long term in the face of everyday events, you know, there's, there's illness in the family, the roof's leaking, you're overdue with the rent payment, you know, all the real things that happen in life. Now, that really gets in the way of thinking about keeping your weight down all the time, because as long as people have got it at the front of their mind, they can do it. But cumulatively over time, of course, weight, weight does creep up. So, that's what direct showed. It's practical, it works, and we now face the next question of, okay, what's the best way of really keeping this going over years? For sure. And I want to get back to that discussion about maintaining this weight loss, but to expand on some of the specifics in these trials, just for the listeners, some of the nuts and bolts, what was the average amount of weight loss amongst the participants who achieved diabetes remission? That was the average was around 28 pounds. And so uh, in our people that were in this big study and direct, and I should say that we recruited people only in the first six years after diagnosis. As one of the things that we learned from counterbalance, where we took all commas up to 24 years of diabetes, was that the remission went down and down and down as the years ticked by. So that's a, that was another feature that opened up. So we only looked at the first six years of type two diabetes and uh, that allowed us to really focus on just 
who was going to get remission. Nine out of 10 people who lost 33 pounds got remission. And uh, let me see, in kilograms would be 10, 20, about, um, if you lost about 22 pounds, then two thirds of people could get remission. So you see, the more weight you lost, the more likely you were to go into remission. But because we're talking about crossing a personal fat threshold, we're really talking about an unknown journey you're starting off on. Some people find that they've crossed it by losing just seven, 10, 12 pounds, but relatively few. Most people need to lose about 20 pounds and some people need to lose a bit more than that. But for that reason, we still talk about 33 pounds as being the target. That's what people aim for. Great. And I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of all of these points you've made about how this is an individual journey and, you know, the personal fat threshold and how much weight you need to lose ultimately is dictated by the individual to achieve remission. While the personal fat threshold can explain a lot of these outcomes, I think another one that is important for us to touch on is why might the duration of diabetes affect whether or not the individual is, is able to achieve remission. And then further for those who, so it seems that as a longer duration equates to less potential chance of achieving remission, but some people who have had type two diabetes for an extensive period of time do achieve remission. So how, how do we explain that to people? It looks as though the reason that the fat next to the insulin secreting cells, the reason why that fat causes a problem is that it causes the insulin producing cell, the beta cell, to lose its specialist function because it's under stress and it curls itself up. It goes into protective mode and it devotes all its energies to looking after itself, keeping itself alive. Now, if you take away the fat after a short while, it can come out of that shell and open up and things are fine. But individuals vary again. And there's a factor I would call resilience of the beta cell that some people have beta cells that can happily batten down for years and then take away the fat, they're fine. Most people have beta cells that give up the ghost after say 10 years. And that's, that's a sort of average time because that's around about the 50-50 mark. Um, but it seems to be the case again that this is likely to be a genetically determined characteristic. So what's the, the practical message from this? Well, the practical message is at the time of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, that's a medical emergency. It's not a reason to say, oh, cut back on the sugar a bit and come and see me in six months. You see, people have got to grasp that we have a window of opportunity. How about if I'm talking to one of your listeners who has had diabetes for 15 years? Well, it's still worth losing the weight. What are the advantages? You may get rid of your diabetes and stop all the tablets. That's a possibility, although relatively low statistical chance, but statistics are fine. Your you is going to be one or the other. That's a possibility, but what's the certainty is that the fat handling inside the body will go back to normal. Your risk of heart attacks and strokes is going to come down dramatically. I can put numbers on that. At the start of direct, the average uh, risk for 10 years of having a stroke or heart attack was just over 14%, about 14.5%. And by the end of the weight loss period, it was way down on that. It was 8%, which is the same as age match people. So you've gone back to normal if you got rid of your diabetes, and it was down to 11%, which is still pretty good, if you hadn't got rid of your diabetes. So there's a big advantage for the protection of your heart to lose weight. And there's a third advantage that people don't anticipate. You know, Mike, I'd started off looking for the cause of diabetes and I have inadvertently stumbled upon the elixir of eternal youth. And that was just wonderful. 
people come back and the commonest thing they say to me is, I feel 10 years younger. They can run up the stairs. They can run faster than their grandchildren. They play football with their grandchildren. They enjoy life. And this is something that we've lost sight of in our society because it's accepted that adults put on weight throughout life and someone who is about 50 always looks a bit heavier than someone about 20. Uh -uh. That's not a biological change. It's reflecting our environment. And so just bringing into sharp focus this advantage of grasping the amount of weight we need in order to get back a decent quality of life, that, that really is quite an important observation uh, from our studies. All the way through my professional life, listening to my patients has been what I've done. But now we're listening to our research volunteers and they give out this very clear dramatic message. Yeah, I think those points are so important to highlight in that you might not be able to objectively achieve diabetes remission if you've had diabetes for 25 years, but there are a vast array of benefits to still be obtained from utilizing uh, a very low calorie approach and achieving substantial weight loss, which brings me to something that I think is absolutely fascinating about the designs of your studies, and that is these very low calorie diets, and perhaps even more so, uh, they're you're using a complete liquid nutrition formula, right? So a lot of people on the surface think, well, nobody wants to do that. Uh, that's not something that anyone could tolerate for more than a week at a time, but you have objectively assessed the perception of the people on these diets, their thoughts about it, uh, the challenges that they faced and the success that they experienced. And, and I would like for you to expand upon this because I think for everyone looking at it, they're going to say, well, I could never utilize this with my patients. They would never be interested in such an approach. That's absolutely right, Mike. That's the initial feedback from GPs until they do it with their first patient. And then the scales drop from their eyes and they discover what I learned from our very first counterpoint patients, that this way of losing weight that I'd put together as being pragmatically effective for the study turns out to be really quite acceptable and obviously effective. So what we did uh, and what we still do in our ongoing studies is to use three liquid meals a day of 200 calories each and encourage people to have a big plate full of non-starchy vegetables, things like lettuce or green leafy vegetables, anything that doesn't have very much in the way of calorie content. You can even make it interesting, the scattering on flavorings, etc. You know, this isn't a starvation diet. For the first 36 hours, people feel hungry, they, they miss the food. But after that, remarkably, there is very little hunger. Now, it's partly due to the high protein content of the formulations. And these diets have about 25% of the energy content as protein. Now, you or I would only be eating maybe 12-ish percent of our uh, food as protein. So you see, that's been bulked up in this diet. We don't just take the word of our patients. We've had a team of psychologists who've been studying things independently. So they work separate from us so that the research volunteers don't feel that they've got to say all the nice things to them because they're not involved with handing out the, the research. And we've already published on the, the counterbalance work and people find it much easier than they had expected but I don't want to trivialize them of this. It's, it's a challenge for anyone and it's a challenge for the whole family. And that's why the very first step in approaching this is to think about it and discuss with your spouse, partner, close family, because they're going to be affected by you not showing up at mealtimes. Of course, you'll be a bit grouchy the family, yes, has got to go along with it. But something interesting happens. The spouse almost always loses weight too. And they come along for the research appointment with their uh, husband or wife or partner. And they sit there with a big smile on their face. And eventually it bursts out. 
and I've lost 10 pounds as well. <laughs> so getting over this message that it's a family decision is really important. No, no man, no woman is an island. And nowhere is it more true than an eating behavior, which for us humans is a social activity. So we've got to grasp that and just see where we are in our social position in the context of normal life. So first, the decision, second, confirmation that the family are on board, and then there's a matter of deciding when to do it and going for it. So it's not just a simple matter of thinking, hey, there's, a, there's an easy looking diet, I'll do that. It, that would not be that effective. People would find it very difficult. This is a simple approach, but that's not to say it's an easy approach. There's, there's not an easiness about changing your behavior for eight weeks. But if I was to put it to you, Mike, or if I was to put it to a doctor that said, you know, that's terrible, none of my patients would do that. I would say, well, what do your patients say when you're explaining to them about dealing with the cancer that you've just diagnosed and that they'll have to have an operation and they'll have uh, quite a while in bed and they'll have to take probably three months off work, but there's a good chance they'll be cured. Would they do it? Yes. Well, here we're facing a disease which causes terrible uh, morbidity, terrible illness in the long term with nerve pain, with blindness, with premature heart attacks, a man getting type two diabetes at the age of 45 almost certainly won't finish his working life to the age of 65. So this is not a trivial condition. And so viewed in those terms, is this something that's worth doing? Yes, for most folk it is. So we have to set it in context, but just make sure it's realistically explained what's involved with this. And under those circumstances, it works. What would you say about the reason why practitioners think their patients wouldn't adhere to this? Perhaps there's this, we're, we're underestimating people, we're underestimating their capabilities or their potential to uh, really put their foot on the gas pedal and stringently adhere to something because perhaps we're looking at the worldwide rates, rising rates of obesity and saying, well, no one would like, people aren't interested in losing weight, especially utilizing a nutrition approach. So dull at one such as this, and perhaps for those reasons, <laughs> perhaps for those reasons, they think they wouldn't adhere to it. But if we look at, if we consider that someone might not be compliant to this approach on the surface, perhaps because of the rising rates of obesity, do you think that there's some advantage to using a shake in particular? Or, yeah, so maybe, maybe touch on that. Why, if the shakes could be uniquely beneficial? Yes. Now, why do health professionals think that it's going to be uh, a failure? Well, lifetime experience, because there's been this pressure to advise steady cutting back of calories, of uh, eating lots of vegetables, and that gets mixed up with this dreadful notion of healthy eating, which is all about talking about things that people don't like to eat. Oh, by the way, have lots of beans, uh, lots and lots of pulses and lentils. Yes, very tasty. And it's just off-putting and people find it difficult to do, not least because they eat in a family circle. Are they going to change the diet of the whole family? Well, some enthusiasts do, most people find it difficult. So that's a medical point of view. It's, it's hard when experience that makes them skeptical. Uh, that's, that's really uh, the point. Now, why shakes rather than not real food? Well, people can do it with real food. But several points, if they do, they ought to take a vitamin supplement because it's difficult to take in the full range of vitamins on about seven to 800 calories a day. Secondly, it's difficult to get in the amount of protein that satisfies you as much as you get satisfied with the liquid shakes. But thirdly, you've got to think. Now, I know as an academic that thinking is painful and Having to plan every meal, every day, constantly thinking about what you're going to eat or more to the point, what you're not going to eat, that is a mental strain. Whereas mealtime, 
what are you going to have? I'm going to have a packet and you can choose the flavor. You see, there's an ease about that and people appreciate that. We analyze the email influx after the counterpoint study. And it was interesting because half of the folk had done it with eating real foods and unmanaged. The other half had used shakes and they reported having an easier time of it. So that's the shakes compared with real food. It's just easier, but the goal is weight loss and you can do it any which way you like. Now, there's a final point I'd make, and that is why lose the weight rapidly? Why not just try and do a uh, death by a thousand cuts um, approach? Well, you get really positive encouragement from your own body. On this diet, people lose an average of uh, uh, just under seven pounds in the first seven days. Now, half of that is water, of course, with starting uh, a, a relative fast. But after that, the rest is over 90% fat. We know because we measured these things in counterpoint. And people suddenly are able to get out of the chair without going, Ooh! <laughs> and the whole family notices. And within a couple of weeks, the friends start saying, you're looking a bit fitter, Joe. What have you been up to? And this positive encouragement right from the first one or two or three weeks really helps. So those, those are the practical reasons that we've learned over the years from observing real people. Th those are the reasons why we do what we do. I love that. This is something I'm passionate about in that dieting is not a lifestyle, right? So the nutrition approach you take to lose weight does not need to be the approach you take long term to maintain your weight. And there's really still this pervasive myth within the nutrition community that every solid diet is built on the foundation of one change at a time. And this like, tedious, slow process. And then furthermore, that rapid weight loss may be dangerous, or even more so that you're bound for uh, weight regain to such an extent that you're going to be heavier than you were before you started the initial diet. And I mean, literally for over decades now, we've known this, that this isn't true by any stretch of the imagination. But in, in this context of maintaining weight loss and the nutrition approach you take long term to keep it off, how should individuals be approaching this process, right? Because we know that people are pretty darn good at losing weight. The data we have available, a variety of approaches can work to lose weight, but the rates of maintaining that weight loss are abysmal. So what is the right way to transition to a period of weight maintenance? And in the context of diabetes, is there an amount of weight that someone can put back on and maintain remission? Do we know that? Okay. So two, two quite separate questions, yes. Mike. The approach to the weight maintenance. First of all, people have got to recognize that if they go back to eating the amount of food they regarded as normal for them, their weight will go back up to where it was. So they've got to make changes that they can sustain in the long term without enormous thought, without everyday pain. They've just got to be able to do it. And there are various ways of thinking about approaching this. Basically, you could cut out most of the um, easily available sugar from the diet, including easily available carbohydrates. So no sweet foods, no cookies, no cakes, no puddings, uh, no uh, cappuccinos with added syrups, etc. They could be hugely calorific. So first of all, what you might call the lowish carbohydrate approach. Uh, low carb is fine, but the data, such as the paper you referred to just earlier, suggests that people do find it difficult to cut out all carbs in the long term. Now, cutting out the refined sugar is a possibility. Secondly, there's a matter of alcohol, which for some men and women is a relatively easy thing to fix on. Because, yep, you can go out for a few pints with your mates, but maybe the middle two pints are going to be uh, diet lemonade. You know, you've got to figure out ways around it. So low sugar, 
lower alcohol. There's a matter of just uh, intermittently cutting back. Now, intermittent fasting has become quite popular. When I first heard of it, I thought that's not going to suit anyone. And then it did suit some people. And it suits people if it's in a family environment, usually a husband and wife together, children are left home, and they really don't eat anything on uh, Thursdays and Sundays. And that can be really good. So those are the commonest ways of uh, achieving the weight loss. But whatever way people have got to regard the whole food as being uh, the totality they've got to do, and they've got to cut it back in such a way that it's not going to bother them overly much um, in, the, in the long term. So those are the important factors for long-term weight maintenance. Together with one other thing, people have got to tell their friends, got to tell their workmates that, look, they don't want to eat between meals to stop them being drawn into this social thing of, hey, we're having cakes because it's a birthday. Okay, Luke, you can have a birthday and celebrate. Why don't you dance instead of eating? Now, there's an idea. So, you know, people have got to be aware of these things and also aware that we're dealing with a long-term effect. So those are the, the approaches to eating. Now, you did ask a separate question, which I've lost sight of. Yes, since it's pretty clear that people struggle with maintaining that weight loss, it, from your research, have you discovered that there is a certain amount of weight that people can put back on and still maintain remission? Okay. Let me start off by saying that lots of things are uncertain about type 2 diabetes, but I've come across a certainty that if people put on all the weight back again, there's a 100% certainty that we'll get the diabetes back. Because between that level and where they were free of diabetes, somewhere there's their personal fat threshold, we find that there's a big range in weight people need to gain in order to get the diabetes back. So my advice is to try and find a weight that you can maintain without huge effort day to day, and then have your HbA1c checked. And if you're still free of diabetes, you just carry on, try and carry on doing it. If the diabetes has come back, that's tough. And you've got to do a negotiation, negotiation with yourself as to what's worth doing. Fantastic. I think I've squeezed in all of our talking points for today's discussion. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for your time. I think there's just one point at the end, Mike, that I'd make because it causes a lot of confusion. I haven't mentioned exercise. And that's for a very good reason that the people developing type 2 diabetes often don't particularly enjoy exercise. Even those that do, don't do it for that long. And you've got to exercise for a long, long time to be able to shed your weight. In the book that I've published, and it's published in the States by Harper One, Life, Life Without Diabetes, I point out that if someone goes and plays squash and thrashes around court on a Saturday morning, and then criticizes the neighbor for just pottering around the garden. In fact, the bloke pottering around the garden has burnt more energy because it's the time base of the exercise that counts. And if you're doing something for four hours or eight hours, that actually uses up a lot of calories. So most people who are beyond early youth cannot use exercise as a terribly effective way to lose weight. And that's probably the best kept secret in the whole of the obesity field. I'm, a, I'm an enthusiast for exercise. I love my bicycle. You might be able to see that from my general shape. Um, but we've got to be realistic about this. We're, we're not talking about getting my weight down. We're talking about getting down the weight and keeping it down of people who have developed diabetes. And that's why I put all the focus on food. Exercise, yes, that's good, but it's not a way to lose weight. And I think that's a really important message to finish on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that clarification. Uh, any, anything else to add as we put the cap on this discussion? Not really. Um, I had fun writing this book, Life Without Diabetes, because it relates what people told me. And it tells a whole story of things as well as trying to put it into how, a how to do it sort of context. So yes, it's out there. It was released again in paperback this year. So it is available. Um, and 
people just have to grasp this information. And I'm still working hard to make it this information available and believable to all doctors because I'm working in a belief system in medicine, just like any other human belief system. And it takes a long time to change beliefs, whether they're geographical, whether they're to do with the climate, whether they're to do with politics, heaven, heaven help us, or anything else. If people believe something, you don't change that by providing a few facts. It's a long-term process. So I've been working away at that since the counterpoint study was, uh, was published. And I'm very grateful to you, Mike, for your help in just spreading the information and getting people to think about this new uh, approach to type 2 diabetes. It's my pleasure. I have, the, I have a copy of the book. I can't recommend it enough. It's an extremely useful guide on the science and application of the concepts we discussed today. Dr. Taylor, anywhere else we can point the listeners for those who want to go learn more about you and support you? Well, they can uh, look me up online. If you were to Google Roy Taylor, Reverse Diabetes, Newcastle, or some mix of that, they'll find my university website. And on that, I have got all the basic information about how to do it and brief reasoning about what's going on. Fantastic. And I will link those up in the show notes. But that does it for another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. My pleasure, Mike. Bye-bye.